Alright, let me get this started, I guess. Uh, not that many people here. <laughs> Alright. So most of you have turned in the video project outline and introduction, uh, but if not, it was due Sunday. Uh, so please get that in. Um, the rough draft will be due next Monday. That's three pages of the six pages uh, for the rough draft over the video. Um, and then we'll have the, if you haven't done it, the lab for the WAN links. And I'll talk about that a little later, um, which that's due Sunday. So um, we'll talk about that because we're talking all about WANs uh, today. Uh, next week we'll do our exam, uh, exam two, over chapters six, seven, and 12, all right? So we'll go over chapter 12 today. And, and the interesting thing is, is we'll probably cover all of 12 today. It's a pretty short chapter, technically, at least. <laughs> um, but fear not, we'll probably, if we do get through it all tonight, on um, Wednesday, we'll start going over subnetting, uh, which is the project that will start and the chapter that will start um, after spring break. Um, but I figure the, the, the more that you get introduced to subnetting, the more time you have to it, the better off you'll be because um, it's a difficult, a difficult subject to grasp. Um, but so next week will be the exam. And then the week after that is break. So um, There'll be no classes um, the the ninth or the eleventh, right? So, uh, but I'll 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 tell you that next week as well. So uh, there was confusion in the morning class on when it was. Is that some were thinking it was next week? It's like no, we're we're in class next week. <laughs> we have an exam week. Uh, let's see here. Uh, all right, let's just go ahead and. Oh my God! Get it. <laughs> it's a zero. We're 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 light a pin, huh? <laughs> Should I give extra credit if you have a pen? <laughs> it's fine by you, right? <laughs> All right. Okay, so yes, we're going to talk about wide area networks tonight. Um, all right, so and wide area networks um, are networks that traverse a significant distance and connect multiple local area networks, right? Um, but the type of WAN that we need will depend on traffic, uh, our budget, and how big is our geographic area and that we need to cover, and then what's commercially available um, through technology. Uh, so LANs connect nodes or our devices, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And uh, LANs connect our LANs uh, typically over a, ge a wide geographic area. Now, LANs and WANs use the same layer three protocol. Um, and but in higher levels too, layer four or five. Um, so what what's typically at layer three? What, what's our protocol at layer three? What's that? IP, right? IP, right? So both our local area networks and our wide area networks will share our layer three protocols, which typically is IP. Um, where they will differ is our layer one and layer two. Um, how we, you know, our access methods, the, you know, the topologies and what media 
we might use uh, might differ between them. Um, our local area networks, typically the organization owns the wiring, right? It's privately owned, you know, so like here at TCC, all the Ethernet cable, right, is owned by TCC. Um, whereas with WAN, the wiring is typically owned by the telcos, uh, the telecommunications carriers, or the network service providers, right? They own the wires connecting the LANs. Um, And here's uh, an example, right? Uh, so you have the LAN on the left, it's just typical um, local area network. Uh, and then the WAN on the right, um, showing the uh, point to point between Miami and Houston, uh, but potentially a, a point to multi-point uh, to San Francisco, Detroit, and New York, right? Because it can be multi-point, one site to two or more, um, or a point-to-point. -point. And we have different names for our equipment. Um, we have a data terminal equipment, or DTE. This is what the customer's uh, device or the organization would have. And the data communications equipment, or DCE, and that's going to be um, the carrier's uh, device. Right, so here it shows uh, the customers responsible um, for the small off office, home office router, the wireless router, um, the DTE device, and the DSL modem is responsible by the carrier. They own and, and are responsible for the modem. Um, now, a little gray area, a lot of times we rent uh, the wireless device, right, from the carriers, right? So that kind of muddies the water. But technically, that's our device. Uh, it, it, the router is. And then we have two main uh, categories for our connections and WANs. You have a dedicated line or a virtual circuit, right? So dedicated lines are just that. They're dedicated. They're ours. You know, we don't share um, the bandwidth with anybody. Um, and they're continuously available. Um, virtual circuits, they can be either permanent virtual or switched virtual. And it logically appears to be dedicated um, from our end. Uh, but physically, they can be configured pretty much any way um, through the carrier. There's just so many. Uh, options that we can't even go through and list how, how they could possibly, you know, configure these. Um, but uh, with switching, right, we, uh, if we do the switch virtual network, um, it, connections are created between nodes on the network. Um, circuit switch, the connection is established between the two nodes before they begin transmitting. And packet switch, data is broken into packets before it's transported. And we're going to go over a few of these, right? So you got layer one on the left column, layer two um, in the middle column, and then the media in the third column, right? So this is where they said that layer one and layer two differ uh, for WANs versus LANs, right? I'm not going to really focus on the dial-up or ISDN. These are pretty obsolete technologies. We don't typically use these anymore, um, but we do use DSL and cable, right? Um, and they both use copper and or fiber optics, um, but um, <coughs> DSL will use the point-to-point -point protocol, PPP, Ethernet or ATM as its layer two, whereas cable uses cable broadband and Ethernet for its layer two. The Metro Ethernet, um, which is pretty uh, nice when you have this available, right? Uh, uh, it uses Ethernet or MPLS, and it can use copper, fiber, or wireless. Um, and these are just mainly uh, in metropolitan areas uh, to get, provide high-speed um, bandwidth to, to their users. And they're pretty sweet when you have them. They're usually pretty 
pretty inexpensive compared to uh, T carriers um, and sonnets, um, but giving you options uh, higher than DSL and uh, cable broadband, um, they're, they're really nice. Uh, so our T carriers, um, these are your T1s, T3s, we'll get into them a little bit uh, later, uh, but they'll use the point-to-point uh, -point protocol just like DSL. Um, they offer frame relay uh, or ATM and they could use copper or fiber. And then sonnets, they're the high end. Uh, typically it's only a large, large, large company uh, or the ISPs themselves are gonna use sonnets. I mean, they're, they're extremely expensive otherwise. Uh, and, but they use pretty much anything but ethernet really. Uh, the, point to point, frame relay, ATM, and MPLS. Um, but they are only over fiber optic and due to their speeds and, and the uh, uh, requirements uh, for service, um, they're gonna only be on fiber. Um, and this is just saying, you know, before you call in, you know, before you call your ISP, make sure it's not your device that's causing the problem, right? Because that's the first thing. And then regardless, they're going to ask you, did you turn it on and off again, right? Is it plugged in? <laughs> Is it plugged in? What lights are showing, right? Have you tried turning it on? Right. Have yeah. you tried turning it on and off again, right? Uh, yeah. But uh, you, you do need to know all those things so you can answer that. Um, because if you can resolve the, 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 uh, the uh, issue, yeah, you're better off before you try to get on and talk with the ISP anyway. Um, but you also need to know what's yours and what's theirs. Um, and then equipment that belongs to the ISP, we should not touch, you know, even if it's on, on our side of the DMARC, right? Um, it's their, their equipment. We should not uh, be touching or messing with their equipment. Uh, One, we probably don't have access to do anything other than turn it on and off anyway. But. And then so our normal devices, uh, the network interface unit uh, sometimes, uh, or a smart jack is just a more intelligent version of the NIU. Um, you'll find these more for your uh, T1s and, and, and DSLs will have a net, network interface unit as well. Uh, the CSU, DSUs, uh, you'll find those definitely with uh, the T1 lines, the T3s, uh, you'll have CSU, DSUs. Uh, all right, and this just goes off some, some big issues um, that we can look at um, and see if we can resolve it, all right? So interface errors, uh, never really seen those, but uh, I guess if they're counting a misconfiguration, then I'll go with an interface error. <laughs> but uh, DNS issues, router misconfigurations, and interference. Um, all right. So physical layers, right? Layer one, right? We have DSL, ISDN, Sonnet, and then our T carrier links, also cable, right? Broadband, uh, cable shared by mul multiple customers, right? You, have, you know, you have a node, and however many people are on that node, share the bandwidth. Um, DSL and, and cable is a uh, best effort, right, to attempt to provide up to advertised bandwidth and uh, uh, also service is really a best effort if you go down, right, there's no real time frame or getting fixed. Uh, bandwidth is asymmetrical, so download speeds are faster than upload speeds. Uh, then versus your uh, direct or dedicated internet access, you know, it's dedicated to a single customer. Bandwidth is symmetrical. Download up so the speeds are the same. And important for the business to back up large amounts of data, right? It could be 
um, but they're going to come up with better guarantees as well. Um, they'll probably, you know, like your T1s and T3s will have like four hour restore to service or some kind of service level agreement instead of this best effort, you know, that you'll get with DSL and cable. Um, yeah, so the public switch telephone network um, or a plain old <laughs> telephone system, right, POTS, as it's known. Uh, the wave of the future, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Back back in 1950, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you can still transfer data over the the, the POTS telephone service and it uses a central office uh, where the telephone company terminates its lines uh, and switches calls between different locations. In a lot of places, in a lot of places, no. I mean, you, I mean, but technically, if you if you have a phone line, if you if you, if you have a phone line, you can dial out and you can configure with somebody else that has a phone line, and you could call and dial in and use modems. But I mean, getting a modem nowadays would be that would be your challenge. Um, so technically, yes, it does work. I don't know in what scenario you would ever really want to do that. <laughs> um, but it is, right. <laughs> I mean, you can't do a lot at 56K. <laughs> um, the last mile is uh, called our local loop, right? And that's the portion of the, uh, I'm going to just call it the POTS network uh, that connects the residents to, or business to the nearest CO. Um, but this does still apply to our DSL lines, right? So DSL line is, is still technically on our uh, public switching, what, is, what do they call it? Public switch telephone network, uh, right? So it says dial in and dial up and ISDN are mostly obsolete uh, and for most reasons, it's just not. It's not practical for the phone companies or any ISP to offer it because the cost isn't there. Um, this is just a picture showing the lo local loop between the so central office and the c customer's home. All right, so our DSL line does operate over the uh, public switch telephone network. Uh, and it competes with cable and T1 services. Um, it does require repeaters for longer distance, uh, and distance matters, right? The further you're away from the central office, the worse your connection will be, and the more problems you'll have. Uh, uh, and it will affect throughput. Um, it supports multiple data and voice channels over a single line, and uses advanced data modulation techniques, right, uh, to help deliver the signals. So we have several types of DSL. XDSL represents all of them, uh, refers to any. And then, but the most popular and most common is ADSL or asymmetric, where we have faster downloads than upload speeds, right? So most DSL um, does this where you get faster download speeds than upload. Um, and that's typically what most of us have if you have DSL. Uh, then you have VDSL, which is either very high or variable DSL. Um, and there, I guess I'm not sure where the cutoff is of where uh, it's faster than ADSL. Um, then you have symmetric DSL, which is not as common, uh, where your download and upload speeds are the same, um, but they apparently max out at two megs. And like I said, it, you, you don't really see these um, that often. And here is the graphical representation of doing DSL. All right, so you have the customer uh, the premise, you have the uh, DSL modem, um, then the 
carriers facility. We have the splitters, but then you have the what's the D slam, which is the D DSL access multiplexer, and basically allows them to put in multiple customers, and 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 then uh, leverage the the power of their network. That's called the D slam. Uh, and this is just talking about it, right? Um, it goes to the DSL modem, right? Uh, splitters separate incoming voice and data signals. Uh, may connect to a switcher router. Uh, its signal continues over four pairs, untwisted pair wire. Uh, distance less than 18,000 feet. The signals combine with other modulated signals in the telephone switch. Uh, CARES remote switching facility, right? They have splitters, separates digital signal from voice, and then requests are sent to the DSLAM, which, like I said, is DSL access multiplexer. And then a request issued from CARES network to the internet backbone. And And we're just talking about cable. Um, they have a data over cable service interface specifications or DOCSIS. Um, and since this book and slides are a little old, right? Um, they're saying that the max was up to 70 megs download uh, with seven megs upload. Um, but now I'm assuming that we're following the standard 3.1, which now allows us to up to 10 gigabits. Right, because um, most cable companies would go out of business if they only offered 70 megs. <laughs> uh, but this is the uh, network diagram for a cable company. Right? You have the head end, you have various distribution hubs. Off the hubs, you have nodes connected by fiber, and then you may have coax cable or fiber. You know, depends going off off the nodes going into your neighborhoods. Um, but as I said, right, you've got this shared concept of these neighborhoods off these nodes, right? You have that shared data, you know. Um, so technically, you're on the same network sharing the data on cable, whereas DSL, you have a direct connection. You're the only one on the connection it is the difference. And here's a cable modem. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, then we have Metro Ethernet. Um, it really doesn't say a whole lot about it, um, but there's an alliance of over 220 industry organizations worldwide to help provide e Ethernet as, as a service, right, in metro areas um, and developing ways to send Ethernet traffic across MAN and WAN connections. Um, the CET, the carrier Ethernet transport, as an Ethernet-based transport solution designed to overcome weaknesses of implementing Ethernet outside the LAN environment. So apparently there are issues when you're trying to implement Ethernet over WAN interfaces. And here is a topology of their um, buildup is just using switches, right? Uh, and then doing Ethernet. Uh, but WAN-based Ethernet, which is a really cool concept. Um, so, but the advantage is it's streamlined connections, cost-efficient scalability is familiar, right? Our known hardware, it's just switches, right? So it makes it really easy to manage and, and uh, um, leverage. And we got our T carriers. Right, so developed in 1957 by AT&T, we have these uh, T1s, fractional T1s, and T3s, um, and uh, they'll go over specially conditioned copper wire fiber optics and sometimes wireless links, although I'd never heard of the wireless links for T1 or T3. Um, that's pretty interesting. Uh, So T1s connect branch offices uh, and connects to the carrier. Uh, 
There's 24 channels on the T1, and each channel, I think, has 196 bits of data, and uh, it equals 1.544 megabits um, for a full T1. Uh, and a lot of times these are used point to point between locations like a central office and a branch office. Uh, they're uh, more reliable, more sturdy, and less latent than DSL. Um, they will probably cost a little bit more, but you also get you know service times that are guaranteed. You know up times that are guaranteed. Um, so they're they're uh, for a business standpoint, um, they're usually a, a, a better deal, right? Because if your DSL goes down, it could be days before they get you back up. Whereas with a T1, they're obligated like within several hours or whatever to have you back up, right? So if you're doing any business, right, you know, yeah, it may only be 1.54 megs, um, but most businesses, if you're just doing email, uh, web stuff, right, and uh, some video, some light video, you can probably get away with a 1.5 meg connection. Um, and for a, a large amount of employees, you could. If you have, well, maybe 20 or so, but um, but then you go up to T3, which is 28 more times the, the uh, throughput of a T1. You've got the same kind of service levels and you know um, guarantees, um, but now it's like 40, 43, 45 megs. Uh, I can never remember the number, uh, but it's 28, 1.544 times 28, whatever that is. <laughs> so um, it's over 40 megs. Um, but it's definitely going to be more expensive than a T1. Well, they're giving you 28 times the bandwidth of a T1. So, yeah, it's going to be more expensive. Um, but, at, you know, like I say, over 40 megs of throughput, you can handle a, a lot of web surfing and, and web email and, and business activity, normal business activity. Um, you can even do some videos and things like that. Um, now, the fractional T1s, um, those probably not as useful anymore, but they, um, uh, because although once again they come with guarantees, right? Um, but anything less than 1.54 megs, I mean you're not you're not using it for a whole lot, right? <laughs> you might be backing up uh, or or. or I, I really I'm struggling with the fractional T ones in this day and age with with DSL, um, but uh, yeah, because less than 1.5 megs, there's not a whole lot you're doing, <laughs> not anymore. Um, all right, so. Um, T1s do support voice services, though. Um, so, I mean, I guess in that aspect, I mean, if you only needed a few phone lines, right, because it's got 24 channels uh, on a T1, maybe you only need 12 phone lines. So, okay, then the, uh, I can see a fractional T1 in that scenario. But data-wise, I can't see it. <laughs> uh, but this is your typical T1 or T3 uh, setup. All right, so here you'd have a main office on the left here. You got your CSU, DSU uh, with multiplexer going into your smart jack. Then the tel telephone company is responsible for the lines, lines in between. Uh, and it goes to the smart jack into your branch office, the, the CSU, DSU. Um, and finally, in, you're in the branch office. Now, I will say most of the time, majority of the time, the CSU DSU is a card that slides into your router, right? So, uh, right. and this is just explaining what I just explained on that slide. Uh, and then here's a, a depiction of just a uh, regular uh, LAN uh, with the router, with the CSU DSU inside the router, right, with a smart track and going to the internet. Uh, now, Sonnets, right, they're 
a much higher bandwidth uh, a WAN uh, technique than our T1s and T3s. And let's see here, what, um, they're interoperable, they're fast data, I mean, the fast data rates, they can go up uh, at fairly high speeds. Uh, simple link additions and removals and high degree of fault tolerant with self-healing, which this is one of the big reasons you're gonna want this um, for reliability, right? Um, and it's considered our best choice for linking WANs between North America, Europe, and Asia. Uh, internationally, it's also known as synchronous digital hierarchy or SDH. Now, sonnets can and often traverse multiple ISP networks, right? Um, they connect the networks throughout the internet backbone. Um, multiplexers can accept input from different network types, and then they format the data, in, data into a standard sonnet frame. So you, you can have all kinds of different uh, inputs, and then it goes to the standard frame um, and then, of course, you have to have a, melt, a multiplexer to combine the signals and then a demultiplexer to uncombine the signals in which we see here. You got the incoming channels, goes into the multiplexer, then it goes over the sonnet network and then reaches the destination. And then you have the demultiplexer that separates out the channels. All right, uh, Sonnet's big deal is it relies on timing. In fact, it will ship empty frames if there's no data because it needs to meet its timing, right? So uh, it, it will ship without data rather than disrupt the schedule, right? Um, and so it's a consistent sized frame and a consistent time frame. So you know exactly when to expect it and what to expect as far as how much um, and it's, it's connection speeds is uh, indicated by OC or optical carrier levels. And I think an OC3 is like 40 some megs, I th think. Uh, I think it's comparable to a T3. Let me see here. It's been a while. Uh, OC. So, oh, 155 megs, it's an OC3, right? So, let's see. Um, transmission rates, here we go. No, I don't want that. Okay. All right, so um, OC3 is 155, OC12 is 622. 2.5 gigahertz so is OC48, um, but these are extremely expensive lines. But you know they might be cheaper now, and you know, and you know, then you get into 10 gigs and 19 gigs, 39 gigs, right? So you can get a lot of bandwidth, but most of these are backbone levels. And for a company to have a OC12, I mean, I think, and I want, I want to say. Um, yeah, at OC12 level, you're, you're doing a lot of data for business. I mean, you're just, I mean, it's amazing what you can actually do with the latency in that. I mean, it's just incredible compared to a, a DSL line, you know, comparable speed. Um, But it is kind of interesting because you know you've got these one gig connections on, on DSL, but you know, um, and cable, uh, but yet on these business class carrier grades, you know, most of most of the connections for businesses are less than uh, less than uh, 40 gigs or 40 megs. I mean, uh, less than 40 megs. Uh, 
uh, most are. Uh, but yeah, so OC sonnet level connections are for your extremely large companies, long distance companies, uh, ISPs, and telephone companies. And those are the, those are the customers for these sonnets. All right, so those were our layer one technologies for WAN, right? So we had all kinds of different options at layer one, according to them. Um, and then our layer two, right, we have frame relay, asynchronous transfer mode, and multi-protocol label switching, switching or MPLS. Um, it's interesting that they left the Ethernet off, but... <laughs> Uh, so frame relay uh, is a fast packet switch network. Uh, tip, it was developed and designed originally for ISDN, but uh, we use it now on our T carriers and others uh, as well. Um, it, it is connection oriented, which is good. And then here, here's an example of three frame relays, one from each branch, and uh, but it creates two logical uh, permanent virtual circuits, right? So even though you got three connections, it's technically only creating two logical uh, virtual switches, uh, vir virtual circuits. All right, so the permanent virtual circuit is, you know, established before our data needs to be transmitted and are maintained after transmission. So they're, you know, they're virtual, but they're always maintained. Uh, the advantage, though, is, is we're paying for only the amount of bandwidth required, um, and it's less expensive than our other WAN technologies. Uh, <coughs> Let's see, our ATM, our asynchronous transfer mode, right, functions at the data link layer, layer two. Um, nodes do not conform to, our, to predetermined schemes, right? So specifying data transmission timings is required. Uh, each character transmitted start and stop bits are required. Um, it does have a fixed packet size. Uh, it's very small compared to other forms of WAN uh, traffic. Excuse me, it is 48 data bits plus five bits of header, okay? And our smaller packet size requires more overhead, um, but which decreases our throughput, but it has a lot of efficiencies that compensate for this loss. Um, so it's still as efficient almost as other options. Um, even though it has a lot more overhead because that small packet size. Uh, it relies on virtual circuits. Uh, it's considered a packet switching technology. Uh, it does provide our switching uh, advantage. And it's a reliable connection. Um, and it also allows for quality of service guarantees so we can push priority data, so like voice traffic over like email, right? Um, you can prioritize and say your voice traffic goes first, right? In fact, here, I think that's what they show, right? So you got the voice over IP server. It has a high QoS, whereas your email server has a low QoS. So your voice traffic takes priority over your email traffic um, over the network. So that's very beneficial, right? Because you don't want your email beating out your voice and, you know, voice cracking up and <laughs> echoing and things like that. Um, and then finally, we have our multi-protocol label switching or MPLS. Uh, this uh, enables uh, multiple types of layer three protocols to travel over one of several connection-oriented layer two protocols. So basically, we take multiple layer three protocols and send it over one layer two, uh, the mo MPLS. Uh, protocol, and it can handle various types of payloads. You know, MPLS is often used by our ISPs on their own networks, moving traffic or data from one customer site to another, right? 
uh, so it's very efficient for that. Um, it can use packet switching technologies over traditional circuit switch technologies. Um, so it's got some benefits uh, there. Um, and then it can in include prioritization information uh, as to where router should forward the message next. And this is an example here, right? You got all the different inputs, right? You got fiber, metro, ethernet, DSL, T1s, and VPNs. All of these are inputs into it, but they it can handle all those different in inputs, uh, layer one inputs, and create this one network. So MPLS is very versatile in that aspect. And then we have wireless LANs, uh, WANs. Um, mainly designed for long haul uh, data exchange right, with high throughput, right? So especially if we need to go um, remote rural areas and you, know, you need to go distance, right? You'll do wireless instead of digging fiber and all that, right? Although we've dug a lot of fiber now, um, but still um, in a lot of cases doing a wireless uh, uh, backhaul is, is very inexpensive compared to doing with wires. And then now we go into cellular for, well, since it's the wave of the future, I guess. Although our slide's pretty old, right? It's, you know, 5G doesn't exist yet, um, but we know that 5G is in some places, right? Although it probably, from what I still um, have read, I don't think 5G will be everywhere. <laughs> Heavy populated areas, right? Where it makes sense for them, right? Um, but you know, we, you know, we went from 1G analog to 2G di digital, which you know that was a good step. But you know, 3G was where it really started being useful, or in my opinion. Uh, and then 4G just made it so much nicer. You know? um, but at least at 3G, you can surf the web, you can do basic things, and and not uh, want to rip your hair out waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, when 2G, it was horrible, right? 240K, you know, I mean, 384K was bad enough, but uh, but yeah, with 4G, right, we can get uh, uh, up to one gigabits for slow moving clients, 100 megabits for fast moving clients, and of course, 5G is just amazing if we could get there, right? Um, and of course, these are theoretical. I mean, <laughs> I doubt the, we'll get 20 gigabits, but you never know. <laughs> but I'm sure, sure it's. Uh, what's that? Eight hundred megabytes per second. At certain locations, yeah, yeah. I mean that. I mean it's incredible. It would be nice if it were remote, at least everywhere here in the. DFW area, that would be great. Um, but you have the three AT and T, the, the the gig, right? Wired in, but wireless it was, speed test was like five hundred. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Well, still five hundred, five hundred megs. Still, uh, that's what I was showing on the speed test on my phone. Yeah, on your phone, mm -hmm. five hundred megs mm -hmm. on the phone. I I I take that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna knock 500 megs. <laughs> not, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, I'm not doing that much on my phone that I, <laughs> I need that much anyway. Uh, yeah, I try not to use my phone <laughs> if I can avoid it. <laughs> yeah. It's no, it's not good for your eyes. Yeah. Um, all right, so we have two uh, competing voice technologies, right? And depending on what carrier you're on, we'll determine on which one you're using. You got the GSM, Global System for Mobile Communications, or the CDMA, the Code Division Multiple Access. Um, and you'll use one or the other depending on, on the carrier. And I don't know which one is which, but you know, maybe one of you do. But, uh, but, uh, so the cell networks uses antennas and base stations. 
Uh, let's see here. Uh, it's got a picture here, right? So you got the central office, right, from the phone companies, the mobile switching center, and then you got the various towers uh, creating cells uh, from their base stations, right? Um, let's see here. Each base station is connected to a mobile switching center by a wireless link or fiber optics. Uh, and high speed packet access plus is 3G technology, and long term e evolution is 4G. And, okay. And then we jump to the Stone Age, I mean satellites. <laughs> but they, they are useful, right? So they, they still have a purposes. Uh, you know, they originally were used for transmitting telephone and television signals across the Atlantic Ocean. We didn't have any options, you know, when they were first, you know, uh, they were a very cheap alternative. Um, but now we use them for all kinds of things, so voice, video, music, data. Um, Satellites live in geosynchronous orbit, uh, and they rotate the, uh, when the Earth turns. Uh, you have upload, download, uh, uplink, download, uh, downlinks. Uh, transponders transmit signals to Earth-based transmitter. Usually have 24 to 32 transfers, transponders in a satellite, and then you have unique downlink frequencies. Um, uh, and the frequencies and orbit locations are assigned and regulated by the FCC. So you, none of us can just send up our own satellite. You know, I know everybody wanted to, right? Yeah. Uh, and it was a sad day today. I found out that the flat earth gentleman that was building his rocket died. died yeah. yeah, so uh, he, he couldn't prove we were flat and that our satellites don't work. So. <laughs> but anyway, uh, sorry, the slide just made me remember it, right? So uh, so we got our satellites, you got your uplink, downlinks, um, the Earth rotates, uh, and we have different orbit levels too, because I think they put a, a lower orbit uh, ring of satellites um, that are used by a lot of your cruise ships and stuff like that that try to uh, help alleviate some of their issues because cruise ships have satellites about the only alternative uh, for any kind of high speed or any kind of internet, right? Um, and then satellites, they transmit on different frequencies. They have six frequency bands and it depends on the satellite which ones they're licensed for from the FCC. Um, and, you know, uh, right, so for satellite internet service, which it's, you know, some people still use it because, you know, it may be the only alternative out some of the rural areas. Um, they have a dish like antenna, uh, receiver or satellite modem. Um, it's typically asymmetrical. Um, usually the download speeds are two to three megs and uplinks rate range of about one meg, right? But I mean, if, you, if you really don't have cable or uh, DSL options, I mean, it, this does beat pile up, so barely, <laughs> because the latency is really horrible, I know. Um, because it actually progressed quite a bit from when it first came out. Yeah, well, that's... It came out to compete to dial up. Right. <laughs> well, this is true. Yeah, when they first came out, you're right. Yeah, because I tried them because I was out in the middle of nowhere, Illinois, and we didn't have any options at all. And so I tried them, got fed up, and then that's why I built my wireless ISP because there was no options. So I built one. <laughs> I got, got two T1s, threw up a 100-foot tower, and boom, I was in business. <laughs> it was awesome. Uh, then cable came in, and I was happy too. I was sad to close the business, but they undercut me, and I was like, ah, I'll close it. I got high speed access. That's the whole reason I built the thing. A lot of the businesses were upset because they, they, they didn't want cable, they wanted my wireless. I was better. <laughs> but uh, I didn't want the headache. <laughs> 
All right, so we have, I noticed in this summary, the summary has absolutely nothing to do with what we just covered. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to cover it. <laughs> um, right, it is, I mean, a lot of it, right. So proxy server acts as an intermediary, intermediary between external and internal networks. So really, um, Organizations use a proxy server um, as a focal point. A lot of times it's to send all the traffic. So all, all of you right now, when you go to the internet in, a, in an organization using a proxy, all your requests will go to the proxy server and then the proxy server would go out to the internet for you and then it would return. But this is, you know, they would probably uh, be checking for antivirus, you know, viruses, you know, other, uh, issues uh, or they may even be uh, censoring what sites you go to right I mean, if they have that central location they can do that um, from the proxy server so um, there's many reasons why you would use a proxy server um, but it, it, it obscures who's actually making the connection too because it does it on your behalf just like any proxy right a proxy does something on your behalf um, and then so routers have ACL or access control lists or ACLs um, and they can decline to forward certain traffic or allow certain traffic, right? Technically when you're doing that, you're almost making the router into a firewall in, in some instances, but it's just rudimentary. Um, it, it can be very beneficial. Um, I know uh, when uh, uh, denial of services were just starting out and you know people were starting to do these for fun you know um, we didn't really have a lot of devices that are, are available today that the uh, ISPs have in place that help prevent DOS uh, and uh, the my school district was getting attacked with the DOS right we was getting all kinds of stupid things uh, happened to be from China uh, from their IP range and uh, so I just went on my router into my access list and just said send all traffic from this IP range to the null port which is basically says throw it away and so <laughs> um, I used the router and its access control list to just disregard all the traffic from their IPs and all of a sudden everything was hunky-dory again right uh, but then you also have firewalls um, that are specially designed for filtering and doing access and, and that, right? And we have different types of levels of firewalls. Uh, um, we now have uh, application level firewalls that are so sophisticated, um, they can not only deny traffic, but they can look and see what's going on in the traffic and change the traffic, you know, so because they work at the application layer. Um, example is when we first got our first application firewalls um, we were looking at it um, to hide social security numbers in case the developers messed up and were showing and displaying social security numbers in the full digits when they shouldn't be so we would be able to in our firewall look for three digits dash two digits dash four digits right and then matched it would mask the first um, several digits and just show the last four, right? So that was the firewall that was doing it. I just thought it was just like super insane that we're doing this at the firewall level. Um, but it was a good safety feature um, but uh, uh, that you could put in place just in case it passed QA and everybody and they didn't, you know, uh, catch that they were displaying social security numbers. So um, so firewalls can be very sophisticated or very simple, right? And then we have IDS and IPS, intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems, right? So I, IDS just detects and maybe gives you a notification that found something that matches your criteria, whereas a, a prevention system, IPS, will actually do something. It'll say, it's notice something happened and it'll take an action, right? It'll prevent it. Uh, 
spanning tree protocol. Not sure why we're talking about this in this uh, chapter. Uh, it will actually be more relevant. Uh, but spanning tree protocol, what it does is it prevents our switches from creating circles, basically. So let's just say you have switch A and you've got 24 ports and you got switch B, right? It's got 24 ports. And for some reason, right, you, you plug, you need to plug in uh, Ethernet cable to port one and port one on A and B. Now, some, somebody eventually comes in and plugs in port 24 on A to port 24 on B, right? So this on the surface looks okay, except for when, you know, a broadcast storm, you know, a broadcast message goes out to all ports, right? So now a broadcast that uh, uh, starts on A, it goes out port one, it goes out to port one, it also goes out port 24, goes out to port 24, and then it goes out port one and goes out port 24, and then it goes back out and it keeps doing this until both switches die. It basically, it gets so overrun because it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. Spanning tree says, hey, you plugged in two connections onto the same switches. Um, I'm going to kill this one and just pick you know, by a you know algorithm. It picks one port and it turns it off and it prevents this endless circle. You have to have spanning tree enabled. You can disable it. So if you disable it, then you've got to be very careful, not this. Um, it was hilarious uh, because when I first started at the high school, uh, the, the school district, I, the very first job I did was at the high school, and their Cisco instructor plugged in and created this loop because spanning tree was turned off on all the switches uh, at the high school, and I went and very quickly fix that situation. <laughs> but but basically, when they did that, it took out the whole high school because it was all one network. I mean, it just was broadcasting and just looping throughout the whole network. And yeah, I just I always thought it was funny it was a Cisco instructor that did that. <laughs> it's like, you know better. And you know you did it, and all of a sudden the network goes down. Well, how did you not know to unplug it? <laughs> but yeah, hey. All right, so then um, this also goes, um, our switches weren't really uh, secure because our unused ports were enabled at the high school. I also took care of that. Um, but you should disable your unused ports and that, right? You should be specific about what's available so that you don't have people plugging things in and doing whatever they want that have no business um, being there, right? Yeah. It takes you it takes you a couple of minutes to enable a port <laughs> when you're going in to plug in something that's not going to be uh, an end of the world kind of situation. Uh, so disable your ports. Um, right. So controlling users access uh, requires three elements, right? Authentication, authorization and accounting or auditing um, are what's known as triple a now most of you have already done the radius lab right and you enabled the services triple a on the server right triple a is the authentication authorization and accounting service on that server which was a radius server which is one of the more common triple uh, uh, a services um, then we can geofence Right, so we can actually use GPS or RFID and stipulate if the device isn't within this location, you don't get access. Right, so this could be this could be really good for wireless. Right, so if it's not within the walls of your building, you don't want them having access. If they're out in the parking lot, maybe they shouldn't have access. Right. <laughs> Um, but that's only accurate to how accurate is your GPS, too. But uh, 
All right. And then, all right, this is just a, an understatement here. Systems generate many logs. Um, yes. Uh, our, any network of any size is going to generate so many logs. Um, it's not even funny. Uh, but we, we have, uh, at an enterprise level, we have a lot of tools that will aggregate and help you sort and search logs and highlight and flag certain logs for you. Uh, because, I mean, just just our building right here, I mean, it could take five, six people full time and they could never go through the logs if you didn't have tools. Uh, if you just have to actually go through them manually, I mean, it just, it, I mean, it would be insane in the amount of work that it would cost. In fact, um, <laughs> when I was security at a State Farm, um, we had one gentleman, it, it was his, his duty um, to go over the active directory logs and, and to format them and look through and do everything. And, you know, um, and we tried, we, we kept trying to get management to allow, allow me to code up something that would do it and free him up because he was a good analyst. We needed him for other things. But it, it, you know, every month, you know, he had all these logs he had to go and present to leadership and everything. And, you know, it was just, and that was just one server on our network, you know, one set of servers. I mean, it was insane the amount of logs that he was having to go through and sift and, and then present on. And it could have automated, we could have automated it, but they wouldn't pay for the hours to code something up. I was like, okay. <laughs> Let them work at it. Just manually do it. Um, and then our network access control systems, right? Uh, they have network policies. There's, there's a set of rules, and they help us determine what level and type of access to give a device. So uh, some of the, the more common ones are, do you have antivirus installed? Do you have it up to date? Right. Do you have certain software? Right. If not, we're going to quarantine you into this network. And all you can do is download antivirus or install antivirus definitions, but you can't access anything else on the network. Right. Or if you have it, then you get full access or, you know, or if you have uh, uh, a certain uh, 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 device, um, maybe you get into the secure network. Right. All right, so when you're talking about Kerberos, Kerberos is a great authentication protocol. Um, it is a good way to exchange keys, uh, use encryption keys to verify identities of clients um, and exchange information. Uh, it does have the client logs. Uh, I kind of disagree with the Kerberos is an example of single sign-on, just slightly. Kerberos is used a lot for single sign-on. It's not single sign-on. It just enables single sign-on. There's a lot of configuration. You can't just install Kerberos and then, oh, everything's single sign-on. You've got to configure your applications to use Kerberos and then be able to use it as single sign-on. It just doesn't voila magic wand we got a kerberos we got single sign-on it that that doesn't work <laughs> it is it is a it's a great authentication protocol and, and it is great uh, to use uh, for single sign-on solutions because uh, it uses a, a ticket granting system and so it assigns you a ticket and once you have that ticket then you can go across onto the network and if the devices have been configured to accept the ticket, then, then you're allowed uh, access. Uh, and then this is just saying, our radius is one of the more popular, AAA, they say the most popular, although I would say TAC-X, uh, Terminal Access Controller, Access Controller System Plus, um, is a newer version and allows us to separate access authentication and auditing. Um, so it, it's a little newer. It's got a little more uh, options. So I, I, I'd I really, you know, wonder where, you know, where they stand now today, right? You know, is Radius really the most popular or not? 
um, and then web is worthless. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, neither of which is secure, so don't use web. Uh, but it does have some security. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it calls it security, but it's not. <laughs> uh, TK, TKIP was a quick fix for web, uh, but we use WPA2, right? Uh, there's no reason not to use WPA2 ever until there's something, you know, WPA3 or whatever comes out uh, that, you know, uh, can replace WPA2, but um, there's no reason for it. Um, and we had an example. Most of us use WPA2 personal at home, um, and we had the experience in the lab with our RADIUS lab. Uh, to do the enterprise version where we use the radius and it authenticated the wireless client with a server, right? And if you didn't have the right user ID and password, um, you wouldn't have gotten access. And that is the end of our chapter. Like I said, it's amazing how, ma how much that summary had nothing to do with what the slides yeah. covered. <laughs> I caught that this morning. I was like, oh my God. Goodness, I almost just like said no. Well, definitely a different chapter. It almost was, but <laughs> I mean, but it, yeah. <laughs> but it was good information. It was great information. Uh, but yeah, it was almost a different chapter. <laughs> it probably was. <laughs> but I was looking at the information. Hey, we can we can go over it. Um, all right. So, uh, like I said, if you're uh, haven't done so, turn in the video project outline and introduction. And I'm just going to throw this out there. I, I'm, I mean, between, between my three classes, it's like 90% of you have put the outline after the introduction. I, I'm just curious why, why that was that case. But I mean, it, you know, it was interesting. But um, typically an outline goes before. You know, it's like a table of contents, you know, um, before an intro and then the intro and then your paper. Um, so I just throwing that out there. It just, I mean, it just was weird. You know, some of, some of you did it, but I was just like, wow. I mean, it, it is, are they teaching it differently somewhere? I mean, because it's like the majority of you are doing that, which was just, it just struck me as odd. <laughs> that, you know, because I mean, I could see one or two as I, like, oh, okay. But it's like when the majority of three classes, I mean, the majority of three classes do it, I'm just like, are they teaching something different somewhere? <laughs> no, after, you, after, I, after I read that, that you wrote for me, I was like, yeah, that is odd. I started to write all six pages at once, and then right. I was like, well, screw it, I'm just going to do the outline. <laughs> like, right. Well, <laughs> you know, I just, I, I just was curious. I was like, okay. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, I, you know, didn't know if they were teaching something different, you know, because it just was odd. Uh, yeah. No, they're not teaching as much. Well, and I know they, they got too much that they had to teach to the test and things like that. I know that, but, uh, but yeah, it was just interesting. You know, and especially because I worded it outline and intro, you know, I would have figured people would at least, you know, I worded it outlined an intro that, you know, the natural tendency for people would be put that first, right? Um, so that, that also caught me that, and it, like I said, it was just the majority. I mean, the majority of students did that, and I, that took me by, yeah, so it just wasn't one. It was a lot of students between three classes. So, yes? Well, I have a question about the web. Like, yeah, no, go ahead. I'm uh, on a certain part on your DSL. Uh-huh. Uh, what do I get to? It says add the... Uh, Modem three and fast Ethernet two. Right. So we'll, we'll pull up the fast Ethernet two and I'll do the DSL. Right. So, right. So you're uh, you're doing the uh, uh, WAN links lab. Yeah. Right. So that's due this Sunday. Right. So I was going to pull that up and go over that a little. Yeah. So this is a good segue. So. This is the five hours. Huh? This is the five hours. Yeah, the five hour video. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking about the. Uh, uh, Outline and intro, and then right, yeah. and then we have the rough draft due next week. Right. That was a great video too. Yeah, good. I'm glad oh, you liked it. Yeah, yeah. I, I I liked it. it. I thought it was it was good. So, um, 
Yeah, so I mean, it, it covers everything. I mean, it pretty much covers everything. But in some courts, it was better than the book in certain parts. Yes, it is. Which is why I wanted you to watch it, <laughs> because it, it does. It covers so much information. Uh, yes. I have a problem on the version. The version. Okay. All right. I'll let, let me answer his question, and then I will. Oops. Okay. So on this, right? So we're we're adding two generic PCs, one generic server, two switches, two DSL modems, and an empty cloud, mm -hmm. right? So what you're having a problem on is this cl cloud, yep. right? So you got the empty cloud and two DSL modems, right? So we go in here and we first we have to because it's empty because we had to add the modules, so we add the two. Oops. Yeah. For some reason, like, it doesn't show the whole thing in there. Right. The first load in, so, it's like, oh, no, so I, I add my two modems, right, connections, and I'll add my network connection, right. So my one CFE, right. So I've got the two one AMs and then the one CFE. It should. It should. Yeah. 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 Right. So if I go. Yeah, it doesn't say anything about that. No, you have to add yourself. Um, right. It doesn't say it in the instructions. In the instructions in the book. You're in. You're in the book. It definitely says it in one set of instructions. I definitely read that. Right. That. So if you go here into the book. Oh, shit. <laughs> so, we'll go to unit 12. We'll go to read. And, right, no, it shouldn't. Capstone projects. All right, so we add the switches. All right. And then right here, so we add drag two N1 AM modules to available slots, then drag one PT Cloud M1 CFE module to the available slot. Okay. Yeah, All I didn't right. say that in there. Like, oh, in my in my instructions? Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no. They were just a little cliff note. Sorry. Yeah, they're not they're not hundred percent. You gotta go to the book. That's yeah. Gotta go to the book. Yeah, I was like, what's going on? All right. So then when you turn it turn it on and you go to configure and go to DSL, then you should have modem three and modem four and fast Ethernet yeah. two. Yeah. Right. And then it matters it matters which port you go in because if you if you yeah. oops. Yeah. If if I if I remove that and I put it in this slot here, right, and I turn it on, um, now my DSL is fast Ethernet eight, right? Because it depends on what slot you're in as to what what you get. Um, I know. Which switch one did you say to use? Because I know the generic one I use is wrong. Oh, the switches. Yeah, the 2960, yeah, although for whatever reason, some of the generics were working for some people, but yeah, if but they weren't well, working on yours, right, right. The 2960, use, yeah, it says to use generic switches, but you'll probably find less issues if you use the 2960 switch. 2960, okay. Yeah, so um, for whatever reason, from the modems to the switch, the plain generic switch, it, it had issues on some some uh, uh, labs, so uh, yeah. Okay, and then so uh, one thing I do want to say uh, on these is when you do check the results, the, this is just checking a, a few things. I can't check 100%. So that just because it says 100% doesn't mean you may be correct, <laughs> you know, because um, for whatever reason, I may have left off, I think I left off the server IP address. Um, yeah, I did. Yeah, the server IP yeah. address is not checked. Yeah, right. 
So there, there are a few steps that are missing or that I can't check. Um, these, this, this is just a best guess uh, that if you get this, you should be right. Um, but there's nothing better than seeing all green lights and then um, being able to do certain things. This one, though, I will say um, you may or may not be able to get to the website by its name because some labs and it's just it's some students it works dns works and other students dns does not work it usually does not work for pinging for whatever reason the dns you know when you type in www pings www.cengage.com it doesn't work uh, but for some students when you put it in the web browser on the pc it works and others, it doesn't. And even then, everything is completely set up. So, but if it doesn't work, make sure DHCP is on, make sure DNS is enabled, make sure you've set it up, right? There are certain things I have seen, um, right? Uh, some students have not enabled DHCP on their, la their laptops or the PCs. So they have no IP address. <laughs> but the lights are green, yeah. <laughs> but they can't get anywhere because they're not getting an IP address. Um, so these are things that I'm not checking for um, that you, 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 you have to check on your own. But at least if it does say complete, you have a pretty high chance of being complete. So just don't be uh, surprised if it comes back and you know, I, I tell you that you missed something because it doesn't check everything. All right, let's see.